Good morning, everybody. I want to thank everybody for having me this close to Pesach and taking out a few minutes from the Pesach cleaning of the house, the hard, the hard work. And I want to share some Pesach perspectives from the Singer brothers, uh, Rabbi Chaplain Morton Singer and Rabbi Norman Singer of Williamsport, both originally from the Bronx. <clears throat> Rabbi Morton Singer... I have been fortunate enough to speak with his relatives and students, and they gave over to me that his ability to make anyone feel accepted with, with the Judaism was, uh, was a tremendous thing. <clears throat> now, he had a student, I'll just say his first name was Robert. His first name was Robert. Uh, he was a student, not just in Torah, in gym class, in karate, in a lot, of, a lot of different areas. And this was back in a school in Great Neck. And Rob told me that, you know, Rabbi Singer had his times when he could be tough. He told me, for instance, there was one day that he came to school with a non-kosher grape soda. And his Rebbe did him the favor of taking the grape soda and immediately disposing it for him. Now you got to be careful. Uh, a Rebbe just can't do that to anybody. You, know, you, you got to know you, you got to know your customers. But Rob explained to me that one of the things that drew him to Rabbi Singer is that Rabbi Singer had a full appreciation of what he was all about and where he could go, and he and he valued him. And uh, he was actually someone that told me that when Rabbi Singer passed on, that he was absolutely devastated and he couldn't even say his name for years. It took other friends. F great efforts to get him to open up to speak to me, but he just said that the, the way the rabbi just felt uh, made you feel so open and, and part of everything really, really did a lot for him. Rabbi Singer's sister-in-law, Anna Reich, told me that the Singer house, her sister was married to, to Ray Morton Singer, was always full of teenage kids. So nowadays it's very common, you have people talking about kids, they can't find themselves, and now you have all kinds of programs. We're talking the 60s. And in the 60s it was not so common to have rabbis out there accepting and understanding to help teenage kids who weren't sure where they were going. But Anna told me that house with her brother-in-law and sister was always full of kids at all different levels of Judaism trying to find themselves. And they knew Rabbi Singer was going to value you and make you feel good about yourself. Uh, one of the tricks of his trade was he loved Beatles songs. And the early 60s, Beatles songs was the in thing. So if you had a rabbi who was a muscular martial arts fellow and he was into Beatles songs, you, you could feel very uh, wanted and belonging over there, and it helped a number, number of students. She told me there were many, many students from Great Nick, other places, I mean, that he literally saved them. That he, he saved them uh, putting their lives together and the shamas and the, the religiosity, all kinds of things like that. But there was one relative in particular, um, it's interesting, his name is Pedro. Now you have to understand something. Rabbi Singer's wife, Eva, was from Guatemala. There is a Shaima Shabbos community in Guatemala. Rabbi St. Helen Singer, who was married to the older brother, told me she wouldn't recommend... You know anything about this community there? It's too, it's a, she did not recommend going there for Shabbos because she said, anywhere you go, you have to have a, a security escort. She says, some very rich Jews, but it's a very dangerous place. She was there... For, uh, for a bas mitzvah, but Rabbi Singer, I mourn Singer's wife, Eva, she was from Guatemala. So therefore, you're going to find some relatives with Spanish-sounding names. So there's a relative named Pedro. Now, Pedro wound up being a Talmud of Rabbi Morton Singer before he knew they were going to be related. Now, there were times when Pedro told me, I spoke to Pedro, he lives in Eretz Yisrael, and of course Pedro served very well in the Israeli army, and that was partially motivated by Rabbi Singer having served on a volunteer basis in the Six Day War and having been part of the United States Armed Forces. But um, Pedro was a student for a while of uh, his later to be relative by Morton Singer, and he said there were times when Morton could be tough. He said one time he came into a Rabbi Singer came into a room where Pedro was and it was, uh, it was and it was a Shabbat and Pedro and his friends were doing some things that were inappropriate and he said Rabbi Singer really yelled at him and he really gave it to him. 
which is most of the stories I hear about him are not that way, but Pedro said, but I needed it. I needed, I, he goes, that Shabbat, I needed someone to say, hey, I'll put up with a lot of your stuff, but this time you went too far. And he, got, and he says, you know what? And I knew the man loved me and cared about me so I could take it from him. Again, not just anybody could do that. But Pedro stressing that Pedro lives in Israel, and he is an Israeli who has a, a level of observance. May not, may, you know, may not be uh, uh, the exact same uh, level as, as you, maybe more, maybe less, whatever he is, but he stressed to me. He says, I am what I am because <clears throat> Rabbi Morton accepted me for who I was, what I wanted to be, the level of mitzvah performance and Torah learning I felt was right for me, and he gave that value. He didn't berate me, he didn't cut me apart, he didn't say that's not good enough, he, he helped me raise up to a level that I could get to, and that was good, and, 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 I, would, and I would move on from there. And he, says not, and he says not everybody was able to do that. He's another thing he's, that really, really helped me to feel accepted, anyone to feel accepted, Pedro told me back in the 60s, now some of you may remember this, some of the rabbis were isolationist. They made you feel, you know, there's Torah and there's Judaism and try to stay in your box. Try to stay in your box and your neighborhood and your way of thinking and don't look at this, don't read this, don't be there. And this, that's what Pedro said to me. He said, Morty, he was a rabbi that let you know there's a great big world out there, and Jews can be part of it too. Some things yes, some things no, but Morty acknowledges a great big beautiful world out there, and Jews don't have to totally run away from it. So all these kind of things help people, Pedro and, uh, and others, and this fellow Rob, and I heard from him and also, it just made them feel valued in their Judaism. And this is something that we have to remember at the Pesach Seder, because the four sons, like we said before, that's the model of it all. And then the Pesach Seder is a growth experience, but still, it, you can't come to the Pesach Seder, it's my way or the highway. You're going to work with people, you're going to learn from each other, but you're going to have to be able to accept, you know, I can bring you to here, I can bring you to there or you'll bring me up and that's going to be good enough for now maybe I'll improve, maybe I'll but whatever it is, it has value it's not going to be, well if you don't do this and this, uh, you know, I'm going to throw it all away, and they just said Rabbi Singer was not, was absolutely not like that at all his nephew, Dr. Jeff Singer who I got an email that I'm going to pass on to the rabbi well, he told me when you met my uncle he was larger than life he wasn't that tall, but he had very broad shoulders and he had tremendous physique from working out and being in the army and being in martial arts and everything. He said, when you met him, there was just a persona that exuded at you like that. You just felt like, you know, welcome, glad to meet you. I I'm interested to know you. All his students told me, and these are people that are older than me, they're, 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 the, the students I wrote, uh, I spoke to, go from 55 to 64. All these men and women, and they said, when you walked into his classroom, whatever it was, Torah, social studies, gym class, the message was, when you saw him sitting there, was, welcome to my world. You just felt that when you came in, you know? So if you can move all that, transfer that to the Seder, that's a tremendous thing because people need that. We, we, we all need it ourselves uh, at some point. So the question is, if like we brought up with the Malbim, uh, how is Rabbi Singer able to do this? And also, how are you able to justify? Because not to lie to you, I mean, there are parts of the Torah where it doesn't really sound like that. There are parts of the Torah where the Torah says, hey, you don't want to keep this, and you don't want to keep that, and you're belligerent, we can't accept you for this. You know, there's plenty of Gemaras that'll tell you, well, you want to be a kosher witness, you better observe this, this, and this. And oh, you want us to let you shecht? You want to be a sheichet? You want to be a moyal? Oh, you better accept this, this, and this. There's some parts of the Torah that sound pretty hard line. So the question is, you know, is Rabbi Singer just, you know, throwing it all away and say, well, I'm just going to love everybody and that's it, feel good Judaism, or, uh, or, or is there more to it? So there is a Gemara in Baba Basra where there's a back and forth between Rabbi Yekiva 
and a Roman general about what are the Jews. So without getting into all the detail, because you still have Pesach cleaning yet to do, is the Roman official keeps saying, you know, God doesn't like you Jews. You Jews are bad. You're in exile. You're a bunch of sinners. And the Roman official starts quoting Psukim from the Torah. He says, ah, look at all these verses. You're just servants. You're God's slaves. God doesn't love you so much. And the Roman official went so far. It's on Baba Basra. 10A, sweetheart. Uh, he says over there, hey, you Jews think it's such a mitzvah to give staka? No, it's not. God can't stand you. You're not a soldier anymore. And he sent you, and he gives a whole story, a, a parable. If a king sent to kick this kid out of the castle, and people go and start to giving him gifts, you're going to get in trouble. The king's mad at his kid. Kid's in trouble. Don't go giving him staka and presents. And Rabbi Akiva came back and he quoted the sentence we had today, Bani Matel Hashem Lokechem, and he had a counter parable saying, no, 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 if a king would punish his, punish his child, he's trying to teach him a lesson, but he still wants people to sneak up and take care of him. So there's a whole back and forth, and, and truth to be told, uh, the, Roman, uh, the Roman official is not the only guy to pick on the Jews. There's a, there's a piece in, in the Talmud and Kedushin, 36, Lamed Vav, where there are some rabbis there who go at it that, you know, can the Jews really sink low enough that we're not called, uh, you know, his children? Well, still the people, but we're not his children. And they go back and forth at it. So the Ben Ishchai, who was the rabbi of Baghdad, so Iraq's not all bad, Maybe mostly, but anyway, uh, he talks on that Gemara and he gives a beautiful insight, which I'm sure had to be in Rabbi Singer's head, and we can borrow it uh, to try to help us accept everybody. He says this whole discussion in various verses when the Jews are in exile and we did sins, are we children, are we servants, or this or that? He says, number one, in God's eyes, we're always children. No matter what we do. The Ben Ishchai, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Ishbag, that says, don't misunderstand all these Gemaras. Not for a second. The worst, nastiest Jew. You, you, you take out the book about the gangsters, you know, the famous gangster Jews. We don't have to mention them by name. Unfortunately, the list is a little bit too long. We'll just recognize <laughs> Las Vegas and gambling was founded by a Jew. We know it. It's a fact. Nobody argues. You, 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 thank God he came back. Yeah, you're right, you're right. He says, don't misunderstand. To God, you're always a child. Just look in your house. No matter what your kids or your nieces and nephews do, and they aggravate you and they drive you crazy, even if you have to ask them to leave for a while to get straightened out, you still love them, you always want them to come back. He says, that's God. We are always God's sons and daughters, no matter what. He won't take you out of the will. He, he won't. He goes, the business over here about are we servants or, or are we children, he says, that's for us. How am I supposed to think of myself? He says, all these discussions are when I'm in Galut, I'm in exile, and Jews sinned, how do I look at myself? Am I God's child or am I God's servant? And servant isn't such a bad level either, but he says, that's all about how I look at myself. But as far as the way God looks at me, I'm always God's child. The question is, as far as my attitude and working on myself, am I God's child, am I God's servant? But he gives a warning. He goes, but wait a second. Even an opinion that would say, oh, I'm only God's servant, I have too many sins, that's me on me. But towards your fellow Jew? So the Ben Ishchai says, don't you dare. One Jew to another is one son talking to another son. One daughter talking to another daughter. He goes, you never treat another Jew like they're merely one of God's uh, servants over there. That's within myself. Jew to Jew, you're another fellow child of God. He goes, and that's the way it has to be. And he says, don't misunderstand all those uh, other Gemaras over there, even though they could very easily you know, be, be led to such a thing like that. But he says that's where it's all out. So surely Rabbi Singer kept all this in mind with his approach towards putting up with all kinds of Jews. And uh, there was one thing this fellow Rob told me. Rob's a photographer in the Great Neck. 
I don't know if you ever taught a group of kids or a group of adults, and there's always a few who are not interested. Now, I've been teaching a long time, maybe uh, we had various experiences, but it's very disheartening when you come into a class and you prepare and you're trying to do everything, and there's always those few people, those few adults that are off to the side, they're interested in everything else except what they're supposed to be interested to. So Rob told me that he would give phys ed. Now, I, I ask your forgiveness in advance if you're this kid. I had certain days where I was this kid. You ever go to phys ed class, and you have your buff fit. Most people like the phys ed teacher. You have this buff fellow over here, and you know he's working out with you and teaching all these things, and he's teaching karate moves and physical moves and sit-ups. And there's the kids that they're in the corner by the fence playing with the grass. You know, remember those kids? If you were that kid, forgive me, you know? And they're there, and the other guy, and all the other kids in the eighth grade, Ah, oh, we're gonna be tough like Rabbi Singer. We're gonna be honest. And then there's the kids on the side. Hi. Mmm. Look at this bug over here. This is really interesting. Can I discuss my stamp and coin collection with you and bottle caps? So Ra Rob told me that Rabbi Singer was accepting of them too. He was very, very careful when to bring them into the class exercises, when to leave them be and play with their grass and cockroaches. And I want to tell you, as a teacher, that is really, really, really hard to do. Those kids, you just, you, you just want to send them back to the factory or something like that. <laughs> but he says Rabbi Singer, I mean, uh, Rabbi Singer was able to tolerate them in a gym class. Uh, that's the most annoying thing, you know, the kids, I don't want to play, old pack me, and I don't... But he was able to have an acceptance for them too, so just keep all this in mind as you go to your Seder table. Now, I want to switch gears over to the brother and just share a few lines with you because uh, we have other mitzvahs to do. Uh, here's a fantastic picture. This is taken by the newspaper. When you live in a small town, Annapolis is a big town. When you live in a small town, they're always interviewing the rabbi about Jewish things. And here's a stunning picture. The last time David told me how to do this. How do I hold it? This way or this way? Uh, Nati will tell you. Nathan, it's okay. This was taken by the newspaper zooming before zooming? Pesach. Yeah. He's, He's zooming in. He's got it. Thank you, Nati. That's perfect. Stay right there. If you only came for this, we'd love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, as you can see, Rabbi Singer, Rabbi Norman Singer, uh, Yenison Yehuda was a very, dis very distinguished looking fellow over here, and he was very eloquent. His son, Dr. Jeff Singer, sent me, he was in New Jersey, he sent me a gorgeous ode to his father that he wrote about how painful it is to make a Seder without his father, and he gave me permission to send it to the rabbi and to everybody. Uh, it'll give you a Pesach spirit, it'll give you a family spirit, and uh, it, 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 it's just so heartfelt about this, the impression his father made on him at the Seder. So let me share with you just three things Rabbi Singer said about Pesach. Now this is a little funny. This is a class Rabbi Norman Singer gave to Kiwanis. Now educate me. Does Kiwanis Club have a lot of Jews? <laughs> no. Oh, you already said it with your face. All right, Kiwanis Club is the... Rabbi Weissam, have you spoken to the Kiwanis Club or Rotary Club yet? Not yet. Well, guess oh, what the show president has news for you. All right, anyway, this is uh, an Arab Shabbos, March 25th. Hey, March 25th! <laughs> That's this week, uh, 1977, and it is in the Williamsport Sun Gazette. Now, you see, you know it's, it's a small town, not like Annapolis. There's no such thing as the Annapolis Gazette, right? Not just Annapolis Gazette. This was small towns like Williamsport. But anyway, sorry, Rabbitson Singer. I know you're watching. But anyway, uh, and this book is a scrapbook from uh, Rabbi Singer's wife. So it has here a title, Rabbi Singer Addresses Kowanians. Did you know the plural of Kiwanis Club people is Kiwanians? I didn't know this. I'm getting educated over here. Now, I don't know what the plural of Annapolis people is. We're not going to even start with that. What? Annapolitans. Really? <laughs> All right, that sounds neat. So anyway, so Rabbi Singer was talking to the Kiwanis Club, and this is written up by a reporter, as far as we know, not Jewish. 
And he started off his class, like we mentioned before, Passover is beautiful and religiously exciting. You have to really think about that a lot, because in life, if you ask someone what's exciting, what's exciting? Going sailing with David Sleon. That's exciting, going around Annapolis Harbor, right? Bruce would say, what's exciting? Devising a bomb that'll blow up Iran and no one will know that Bruce did it, right? <laughs> Everybody, I, I, well, and of course, Annapolis, the most exciting thing is eating kogo made by Steve. That's exciting, right? <laughs> but Rabbi Singer is trying to give over over here in just a few words. There's such a thing as religiously exciting. Usually you get excited about all kinds of things, but hey, I'm going to the Seder. This is going to excite me religiously, going to charge up my neshama. It's a different way, it's a different way of thinking. And he says like this, you know, Jews study a lot, but there's no night of the year where Jews are assigned, sit and study for a few hours, and give meaning to the rest of the year. Yeah, we study shorts, we study other times, but it's not incumbent. Rabbi Singer says, the Seder night is when you tell yourself, tonight I will give content and meaning into my life. It will charge me for the whole year. There's no other mitzvah where God in charges you. Shuvah's night, you don't have to stay up, okay? We, in general, you're supposed to learn Torah, but you don't have a specific night where God says, sit this night and study together with your family and friends. See, so he says, that means you can charge yourself up with content and meaning, and he says, keep reminding yourself, hey, I'm lucky. If someone digs in the ground and finds a coin from 1920, it's a big deal. If, if you can open up Haggadah, the Haggadah has been around for a long time. He says you're reconnecting with God through ancient text, and you're finding out what it's all about. But he says it gives charge to the whole year. One time I was on a trip. I don't know if any of you like to go to Harpers Ferry. Right before you get to Harpers Ferry, there's a little cavern over there, Crystal Grotto Caverns. Anyone ever been there? It's a cute place. You know what I'm talking about? So I went there with a camp group. And we saw in the water a dime from 1905, and we're all excited. Wow, a dime from 1905. And there was a fellow there named Baruch who just came back from studying in Israel. And he shook his head with a small smile. The Rabbi Weisblum, as they say in the Super Bowl, this buds for you, because this is something you want to say all the time, but you hold it in. Rabbi, I'm telling you, Natan, you're going to say it also. This fellow Baruch who was American shook his head and he said to me, Carp, I want to tell you something. You here in America get excited over a coin for 1905. In Israel, you walk down the street and you bump into bricks that are 2,000 years old. <laughs> he goes, you Americans are really missing act, you know? 1905, you know? Israel, like, you know, the, 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 the youngest thing is 2,000 years old. And then if you walk in the middle of the old city, they have a piece there from Bayad Rishon, you know, like, he just said, you know, Israel's where it's at, you know, that, that's, that's all, that, that, that's all material over there. So at Reisbaum, we appreciate that you don't say that to all the time, mm -hmm. but you know, that, you know, like Americans, wow, I went to Mount Vernon, went to George Washington's house, didn't even leave 300, 300 years ago, you know, you're coming from Israel, like, you know. You don't even, you Americans don't even know what history is, you know, the, the real land. But thank you for not doing that to us. But once in a while you could do it. Not time, you could do it also. But Rabbi Singer stresses when you sit at the Seder, you're charging the batteries and you're connecting with these ancient texts from people who really know what they're talking about and it charges me up for the whole year. So it, it, it's, it's an absolutely, absolutely beautiful, beautiful, wonderful thing. And he went on and tried to give over to the Kwanis as best he could what Passover means to us. And he made it current. And he said, when Jews eat the ground horseradish, they must think about the Soviet Jews who are cut off from their brothers and sisters and trapped in Russia. This was 77. So the Soviet Jews were still locked up. So he made sure to remind them that Pesach is something that happened a long time ago, but we still benefit and we still rebuild on it, rebuild on it again and again. The last thing I want to tell you from him, there's, there's a lot of beautiful things, but I just want to give you one, one last line. This was from a newspaper article. It seems to be in Williamsport. 
that they like to publish the sermons of the priests and the rabbis. They like to publish things that they had to say. And they would come to him for different holidays. And it must have been really, really hard because to take regular Jewish sources and to distill it into something that can be read in a newspaper, read in a newspaper by all kinds of people, all kinds of time, that's uh, it's not so easy. But he was able to distill it. So let me get to the page where he has his comment about Pesach. He says like this, when the Jews were in Egypt as a bunch of slaves, he said, that stagnated our people. When you take a people and you lock them up and you restrict their freedom, you're stagnating them. And you're not giving them a chance to really be connected to the larger world, to do good for themselves and to do good for others. He said, it's just no good. He says, Passover was a renewal. And in a nutshell, this is what he says in short. When the Jews came out of Mitzrayim at first, that ended the stagnation and it renewed their human dignity. If you do studies, black slavery, the Holocaust, the Gulag, whatever you do, our, our, our captors always try to destroy our human dignity. So Rabbi Singer says you have to realize Pesach time is a time to renew your human dignity and to do a check, you know, and do I really celebrate and appreciate my human dignity and other people's human dignity? Because when you stop being a slave, that's, a, that's the first thing, you, you, cease to, you cease to being a number. He says that's number one. But he says the other renewal was, here it is, his exact words. When Israel left Egypt, there was an awakening. The awakening involved the affirmation of human dignity and connecting with the divine. The exodus was the beginning, Sinai was the destination. So Rav Sinker stresses that every Pesach you have to redo that. I'm renewing my human dignity and, and those, are, those are who are around me. But he says, it doesn't stop there. Then what do you do once I got my human dignity? What do I do with my freedom? I do whatever I want? So we know in this country, people who think they have freedom to do whatever they want, you know, you know what happens. That's not what the Founding Fathers meant, for sure. No matter which side you're on, it's a bit much. But he said that restoration and renewal of human dignity had to lead to Sinai to get the direction. And he says, a people, certainly our people, must be renewed and reawakened, cause, and renewal prevents stagnation. And we all know that even though we have a wonderful rabbi and other nice people that come here, sometimes Judaism can get stagnated like a pond of water, like a pond. And he says, Pesach is the time. And, and he, he says, don't just make it a lip service. Do it together with your friends and family. I'm renewing myself as a human being. What kind of human being? A human being that celebrates Sinai as much as I can. So he says, if we can able to do all that, then it'll just enlighten <coughs> Judaism for the whole year. So our, our learning Torah should be a schuss for everyone the Rav mentioned, and should be a schuss for these two singer brothers who unfortunately we lost young. Everyone should have a chag, kashib, and be renewed. Amen. Amen. Amen.